All right, if you guys want to go ahead and stand this morning, we'll get started with worship. How many are excited to be in the house of the Lord this morning? Not bad, not bad. How many are excited to be in the house of the Lord this morning? Much better. All right, well, how about we just start with a word of prayer? Father, we thank you this morning, God, that your spirit is near. Lord, we thank you that, God, we're, your word says we're two or more are gathered through there with it. And, Father, we thank you that, Lord, your presence is in this place. And, God, we just worship you this morning. We praise you this morning. And, Lord, we, we invite your spirit in this place this morning, God, to do what only you can do, what only you can do. And that is to change our hearts from the inside out change our lives, Lord, and, and meet us right where we're at, God, and, and change us from the inside out. Lord, we worship you this morning. We praise you. And everybody said,
You are here working 
Father, we thank you this morning, the God that you are indeed the miracle worker, the promise keeper in the light and the darkness. Father, this morning we proclaim, God, that that is who you are in this place. God, we thank you that, Lord, if we need a miracle in our body or a miracle in our lives, that, Lord, you are the miracle worker. And, God, of the words that you have put in your word in the Bible, Lord, it says that, God, that you are faithful and you said yesterday, today, and forever. God, you're a promise keeper. Lord, the, the promises you make to us, God, you don't ever break them. You're faithful. You're trustworthy. And, God, that you're honest. And, Lord, we just worship you today. Father, as we sit here and we think about who you are, Lord, we, we know who we are. Lord, we know that we're sinful. God, we know that we mess up every day. But Lord, we just want to take a moment, and God, we just want to just repent of our, of our mishaps, of our sin, and how our screw-ups, God, and how we don't measure up, Lord. Lord, your word says that all fall short of the glory of God. And Lord, this morning, we just want to sit at your feet. We want to worship you. We want to worship you this morning, God. We worship you, Jesus. Holy Spirit, would you come? Would you come and do what you want to do this morning, God?
Bible says that Jesus is a very present help in time of trouble. You never know when, you never know when things are going to happen. Literally, as Cody was calling everybody in for worship, I got a text message, Mom, the past. And uh, I'm so thankful that, that God is, I mean, he knows. He knows. He's, he's in all things. He walks with us. We can call upon him like that, you know, and, and he's with us. And it just occurs me, to me this morning, you know, I mean, with, with, that, with that news, you know, I mean, seriously, my, my favorite on um, I'm not the only one. You know, there's, there's, there's people here this morning who, who's struggling. You've got things going on in your life. But, but he's here. He's here. You can enter into that place with him, and, and, and he'll touch you, and he'll, he'll guide you, and he'll help you, and he'll, he'll walk with you through, through whatever it is that you're dealing with, you know? And, and the other cool part about it is that you're part of a family that loves you. There's people here that will pray with you, people that will just drop what they're doing to come be with you, you know? And it's, a, it's just wonderful how God works and how God enters into our lives, you know? And so this morning, you know, if, if you're here and you're, and you're hurt, man, you just got, you got, you got stuff today, why don't you just raise your hand? And there, there'll be people that will, that will, come on, raise your hand. Who, who's hurting this morning? Just be honest. Yeah, we've got some over here, over here. Come on, start moving. Start moving the folks with their hands up and just, just begin to pray over them and bless them this morning. I thank you that the comforter has come. I thank you that our friend that sticks closer than a brother is with us. I thank you, Lord, that, that you are familiar with suffering and you walk with us in our pain. And Lord, you lift. <laughs> You're the healer. You heal the body. You heal the mind. You heal the heart. You heal the spirit, Lord. You, you touch us. You you're with us, God, and it's just so real and so good. And God, I thank you for that this morning. Lord, I don't, I don't know what all these hands that were raised represent, but Jesus, you know us intimately, and God, you love us. And I pray, God, that you would step in, that you would step in this morning. Step in this morning to our place of need. Touch us today. Joel's getting ready to play us a video here. We'll, we'll, we'll save that for a second. But, uh, and like Cody said, you know, the lights, Tim, I need you today or sometime this week, like fast. <laughs> we got to get these fixed. Um, but, 
you know, God's with us always, isn't he? You know? And the choir, let me remind you, we've got practice today at 4 o'clock. And then, uh, ladies, there's a sign-up sheet out in the lobby for... Jacqueline, why don't you stand up and explain that real quick? Yeah, I got you on the spot. Use your, use your preacher voice. time of fellowship and uh, we got some real exciting things coming up through the Easter season and we'll just uh, let this video that Joel's going to play here in a minute just be our announcement for that but anyway thank you for your faithfulness thank you for being here thank you for giving and uh, may the Lord bless you as you give Scott will you will you bless that offering please Heavenly Father Lord we come to you right now Father in the mighty name of Jesus Lord we just thank you for your goodness for your grace and for your mercy Lord I ask that you bless the people today Lord as we give unto you This geriatric fellow sitting next to me is Pastor George Kenneth Fielding of Christian Assembly. Go ahead and tell him about what we're doing. Yeah, okay. Uh, bald man, is his head like glaring on you right now? With his no, hey guys, we're, we're doing something fun this year. We're going to be putting out uh, devotionals every single day of Easter week, the week of Christ's Passion, at 12 noon during your lunch hour. So be looking for it, and uh, we're going to follow Jesus last week, uh, the events of every single day. So keep an eye for it. And uh, God bless you, and, and he is risen. <laughs> all right. Anyway, hey, we're going to let the uh, kids go to children's church, nursery, all that kind of fun stuff. Um, take your Bibles and go with me to John chapter 12. And... Uh, Gwen's word of encouragement puts me on the spot, so this better be good. <laughs> Where'd she go? Nursery. She's in nursery. Okay, she's off the hook then, right? Um, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. <sighs> Let me quiet my heart a minute. Father, I thank you this morning for the strength that you give. I thank you that your word is the bread that nourishes our soul. I thank you for your Holy Spirit that carries us. And Lord, I know that you want to speak to us today. <coughs> speak to our hearts. And I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. John chapter 12, starting in verse 1. I think it's a story that you'll quickly recognize, but there's some things here that are just alive and burning in my heart this morning. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, the hometown of Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So they hosted a dinner for Jesus there. Martha served, and Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Then Mary took about a pint of expensive perfume made of pure nard, and she anointed Jesus' feet and wiped them with her hair. Other, other uh, gospels that record this tell us that she poured the perfume over his head, and, oh, you know, head, to, head to toe. And, and the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But one of the disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was going to betray him, asked, Why wasn't this perfume sold for 300 denarii and the money given to the poor? Judas didn't say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. 
As keeper of the money bag, he used to take from what was put in and into it. Leave her alone, Jesus replied. She has kept this perfume in preparation for the day of my burial. The poor you will always have with you, but you will not always have me. Mm. This passage begins <coughs> six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany. Bethany was a suburb, if you will, of Jerusalem. And Jerusalem at this time was, was really the center of everything that was happening. The, the Passover, people were... Everybody was traveling to uh, Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover, which was just six days out. The city was already beginning to swell with, with people and, and the hustle and the bustle of the preparations for really one of the biggest Jewish holidays. People from every corner of Israel and beyond the borders of Israel would soon be, would be jam-packed into that city. But for Jesus, this marked the beginning of his last week before his suffering. The Passover began on, on, on uh, the Passover that year began sundown on Thursday, the, the next week. So six days previous to that would have been Friday. It would have been two days before his triumphal entry into Jerusalem, riding on a donkey to the praises of his disciples and the waving of palm branches. We'll, we're gonna be digging that next week. It was six days before Gethsemane, where he would sweat drops of blood and be and being betrayed by Judas with a kiss. It was a week before he would feel that icy cold steel spikes driven into his hands and his feet. It was seven days before the Son of God would be lifted up on that cross for everyone to see. But this night was different. Jesus knew that day was coming. But this night was different because it was relaxing. It was joyous. It was peaceful. Jesus was now among friends. His hosts, they're not unfamiliar to us. When in Jerusalem, Jesus often would visit Mary and Martha and Lazarus. Lazarus was the patriarch of this family and evidently a wealthy man and, and loved by the Lord. The scripture tells us that when Lazarus was sick, his, his sister sent to Jesus and said, Lord, the one whom you love is sick. That, you know, it's kind of funny because we see Lazarus reclining at the table. Every, every time Lazarus shows up in the Bible, he's reclining. The first time we meet him, he was reclining at the table. Remember the passage where Martha was all upset and Mary was sitting at Jesus' feet? He was reclining at the table with Jesus then. In John chapter 11, just a couple verses earlier, he's reclining in a tomb. And now again, we find him reclining. He, I don't know, he just like to lay down, I guess. But he's always reclining. Reclining with Jesus. Martha was the oldest sister. She, she was the big sister. She was all the time directing and serving and working. The first time we see her in, Luke, in Luke's gospel, Luke chapter 10, She's ups upset, she's frustrated, she's angry with her sister Mary. Why? Because Mary wasn't doing anything. She was just sitting at Jesus' feet. And Martha complained to Jesus and said, tell her to help me. Don't you see, Jesus, what she's doing? And Jesus, in those famous words, I think some of you probably need to hear, Martha, Martha, you are worried and upset about many things. But only one thing is necessary. And Mary has chosen the good, and it will not be taken from her. This time, though, Martha, I believe her disposition was a little bit different than the first time. She's still serving, but she's not complaining or criticizing. Why? Because, well, if you look at John chapter 11, it tells of the time when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. I don't think that's unimportant to this, to this chapter. Martha now served Jesus motivated by her love and her gratitude for him. She was happy to serve the one who, who raised her brother, who gave him back to her. But Mary, in this passage, she becomes the central character of the, whole, of the, of the story. And we, still, and we find her again at the feet of Jesus, worshiping. 
worshiping extravagantly. I really want you to try to put yourself in the story this morning. I, I, I want to try to paint a picture for you. I want you to just kind of go there with me in your imagination, if you will. Jesus and the disciples, they arrive at the, at, at the home of these three siblings. Lazarus is joyful. He, he joyfully greets his friend and his healer. Martha, she doesn't wait. Just, just think about who Martha is. She doesn't waste much time with, with greetings. You know, she's happy to see Jesus too, but she's a worker. She got right to work. But Mary, tears well up in her eyes when she saw Jesus. At her sister's command, she obeyed Martha. She, she heads to the kitchen like she's supposed to, but her heart's not in it. In her, in her mind, she, in her heart, she wants to be at the feet of Jesus. She's working, but she's working slow. She's working, but she's distracted. She feels like in her heart she's wasting her time doing this. Are you with me? The smells, the smells of the kitchen begin to fill the house. Roast lamb, bread baking. There's the sounds of pots and pans and and, and, and the servants and the women working together, trying to get it, trying to feed all these people. Lazarus and Jesus and disciples, they're, they're, they're out in the main room waiting and laughing and reminiscing about the last time Jesus came. I, I can imagine the scene was more like Thanksgiving at your house than it was, you know, just, just joy. A lot of activity, a lot of things, and the smell, Okay. But suddenly, everyone's focus is now on Jesus and a weeping woman. Everything stops. The preparation stops. The talking stops. And no one's moving. You see, Mary wasn't content just doing things for Jesus. She needed to be with Jesus. She was compelled to worship, she, was, she had to demonstrate her love. And with, with tears of, of love and joy and gratitude all mixed together, she brings an alabaster jar of pure spikenard. On the front of your bulletin, on your bulletin cover, is an alabaster jar. That, it's, it's what it would look like. It was, alabaster was a a marble-like stone that they would shape and fashion into a long stem kind of kind of jar. It was perfect for storing perfume because it was stone. It would, it would hold expensive liquids like perfume. This, this jar, we're told, would hold about 12 ounces. The closure was, was permanent, didn't have like a lid on it. After the, after the contents would be put into the jar, it was it was sealed. It was sealed with a, like a wax seal that, that you couldn't get out. So, so the only way to, to actually release the, the, the contents would be to take the, the jar and, 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 and break off the neck. So as Mary approaches Jesus, tears streaming, she smashes the top of that jar on the edge of the table. There's a loud crash. There's a sound of like breaking glass. And then the smell of the perfume, that very expensive perfume, it overpowers the smells coming out of the kitchen. And Mary empties its contents on Jesus from head to toe. She pours the perfume out on the Lord. Everybody in that room is stunned and shocked, except Jesus and Mary. Jesus understood. Jesus knew Mary's heart, and he, and, and he received her love and her worship. And Mary, she forgot about everybody else. It was like she was in that room alone with the Lord. She was with him by him, like, like she, nothing else mattered. She was pouring out her love and she was, she was giving her best. She was weeping with joy and gratitude and she was humbled by just how much Jesus had done for her. 
I can imagine, though, after, after a few minutes of this, weeping at his feet, she starts getting a little embarrassed because she's realizing that everybody else's eyes are upon her. She didn't think it through very carefully. Because as she, as, she begin, as she begins to wipe the tears from her eyes, she looks and she sees that Jesus' feet are, are dripping with a mixture of the perfume and tears and, let's just be real, snot. She hadn't brought a towel. So she, she releases her hair and she, she takes her hair and she, she begins drying his feet with her hair. You got to see Everyone in that room, everyone in that room except Jesus and Mary are uncomfortable with what they had just seen. They didn't know what to say when next. They didn't know what to do next. They just sat there and stared for a while. And friends, I want to tell you this morning that extravagant worship is uncomfortable for many people. Extravagant worship makes pe many people uncomfortable. Over my years of ministry, I've discovered that, that people are, get uncomfortable with all in, nothing held back, open-hearted worship. I once had a man confide in me that the reason he made trips to the bathroom and the reason why he would... He told me he was going out to pray, but he actually told me the truth one day that he would go out in the parking lot. He pretended to go out in the parking lot to pray and look over the parking lot and make sure the cars were okay. But he told me that he was not comfortable during worship. It made him uncomfortable. I had another man tell me that he and his family intentionally come to church late toward the end of worship because he thought he was giving me a compliment. Because he wanted to come for the meat, the most important part. The singing wasn't important. Another guy told me that he was embarrassed by his wife. His wife was one of those who were very expressive in worship. She would raise her hands, she would dance sometimes, she would clap, she would sing, she would shout. He told me that he was embarrassed to sit near her in worship. Over the years, I've, had, I've heard this comment more than, more than a few times. I'm not comfortable with that. I'm not comfortable with that. I remember when we were on vacation, the whole family, and we walked into a church, and, and as, as, as we were coming down, we realized that there was like, you know, like, like here, like a pocket that would work real good for us, uh, for our, <coughs> our big family, and so we all just kind of began to funnel in and sit down, and, and two ladies came. I suppose they were supposed to be greeters, but their greeting was a little subpar, so. But they, they, they came to us, and they handed us a packet, and after a little bit of chit-chat, one of them said to us, says, you might not want to sit here, because there was a couple, there was a couple, in the, a couple people in the row right in front of us. She, they, they said, well, they're, they're a little excitable during worship. You know, they, they raise their hands, they clap. They're the amen section. They, they speak in tongues. And, and you know, basically, the, these greeters were apologizing for the whole church, for, for, the, for these people. What they didn't know was, I fit right in with those people. I'm one of those. You know what I'm saying? And so, but see, Worship like that makes some people really uncomfortable. Many are uncomfortable with Mary's kind of worship. But I'm going to tell you, those precious few who were those, those precious few who worship with passion and depth and sincerity of Mary. The disciples criticized Mary's demonstration. Nearly everyone thought she's gone too far. She's gone too far. But Jesus didn't. Jesus said, leave her alone. He 
says, you're criticizing her. But I tell you, this is an act of worship that will be remembered everywhere this gospel is preached. What she has done for me is a beautiful thing. <coughs> the fragrance of that perfume filled the whole room. And it wasn't cheap cologne either. It was an Axe body spray. It wasn't, the, it wasn't a knockoff that you buy at some discount store. It was the real thing. The Bible tells us that it was worth 300 denarii. Now, denarii is a single day's wage. 300 days wages. Folks, it was about a year's salary. 50 grand in our economy. 50 grand poured over Jesus. The treasurer, Judas, and the deacons, the rest of the disciples, criticized her. We could have done something useful with that. We could have done something meaningful with that kind of cash. We could, we could plant a new church. We could send missionaries. We could repair the sign in the parking lot. We could replace the old, the old air conditioning unit that's ready to collapse. We can buy food for the pantry. The pragmatic among us, that's exactly how we would react. We would say something like, man, that's 50 grand. She just flushed down the toilet. Is there an amen in the house? Come on. You know I'm telling the truth. I'm going to tell you something, though. Worshippers are precious to God. And they're few in number. Yes, we are. You know, the text doesn't tell us how many were in the house that day. I'm going to say somewhere between 30 on the low side and maybe 60 on the high side. When I, when I began tabulating in my head, there was Jesus and his posse, the disciples. There was the three siblings and their household, their servants. There had to be other guests. So 30 to 60 people, I think, would be reasonable. But I'm going to tell you, in that number, there was only one worshiper that was found. One who opened up her heart and poured out her love and her gratitude on Jesus. There was only one who got down at his feet and worshipped. You see, extravagant worshipers are rare. And, I, and Jesus tells us that his Father is looking for them. The Father is always looking for worshipers. He said, he said to us in John chapter 4, he said, a time is coming and has now come when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking. The Father is searching. The Father is looking. The Father is longing for these kind of worshipers. Amen. Worshiping like Mary is too costly. It's too embarrassing. Most of us are too self-conscious to pour out our hearts in worship. Oh, what will people think? What will they say? I don't want people looking at me funny. I don't want to look stupid in front of my friends. Oh, I don't really need to go to all that trouble. God knows my heart. <coughs> Hello? Everyone in that room loved the Lord, except Judas. Some were serving him like Martha. Some were enjoying being with him like Lazarus. The disciples, I'm guessing that they were distracted and hungry, but they were okay with Jesus too. But there was only one who worshipped like Mary. Only one. Friends, listen to me. Our self-consciousness and our attitude towards worship shows us that we don't really understand it. You see, worship is not about me. My comfort is not the object of worship. Jesus is the object of worship. Worship is always about Him. It's about Him. Worship is for Christ. It's for Christ alone. You see, think about this with me. Worship is the one thing that we do that totally belongs to God. Worship is the one thing we do as a church 
that we can say is should be 100% about Jesus. Think with me. When we pray, we pray for things that we need. We pray for help for our loved ones. Our prayers are directed to God, but they're for our benefit. Right? Come on, let's just be, let's be honest. Preaching. Answer this question. Who benefits from preaching? Is, is, does Jesus benefit by preaching? We preach so that people are saved, so, so that they're rescued. We teach so that people will know how to live. My, my teaching and preaching don't benefit God. It's for the strengthening of the church. The gifts of the Holy Spirit. They're for the edification of the church. During our fellowships, our potlucks, it's our bellies that get full, not Jesus. Our tithes and offerings and our missions giving, it helps people. It helps people spiritually. It helps people physically. It enables us to minister to their needs. But God's not benefited by it. The only thing that we really do that totally belongs, should totally belong to God, is worship. I was just thinking about this as we, as we were standing here. I had so many things going through my mind. <laughs> but I was asking myself, I wonder, Jesus, how much worship do we really give you? I mean, we, we, we come here on a Sunday morning and and Cody and Donna and the worship team, they, 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 they give us an opportunity to worship. But I was, I was thinking to myself, what, what would happen if we would lift that, that 20 minutes, half hour segment out of our week and just remove it? And then we begin to look at the rest of the week. How much of it is given to God in worship? I'm going to suggest to you that 20 minutes, a half an hour, 45 minutes ain't enough. Oh, you guys got real quiet. Everything we do, most everything we do as a church, and I'm not saying it's a bad thing, is for our benefit. But worship belongs to God. The Bible calls worship ministering unto the Lord. There's something about worship that blesses Him, that excites Him, that lifts Him, that lifts His spirits. When His children worship Him, it lifts Him. How much of, how much of what we do is about lifting Him? Oh, Jesus. Forgive us. Shamefully. Church, I, I'm just sharing my heart. Many Christians and churches have robbed God of that what belongs to him. What do you mean, Pastor? I give my tithe. I don't rob him. No, 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 no. You see, worship is not a concert for your entertainment. In case you didn't notice, in, in, in this passage, there were no lights. <laughs> there was no music. There were no instruments. There was no, there was no fog machines going. There was no one singing. When worship becomes about pleasing people, when we sing the songs that our favorite songs, the ones that create a mood, the ones that try, the ones that make us feel good or give us goosebumps or make us feel happy. Friends, I'm telling you, we are robbing God of the worship that belongs to Him. It's about Him. Jesus, twice in His ministry, he cleansed the temple. He went into the temple and he drove out those who were buying and selling in the temple. And he said to them, it is written, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den. Listen to me.
to me. A den of thieves. That's why Jesus drove out the money changers. That's why they were robbing, because they were robbing him, the father of his glory. That's why he made a whip. And that's why he overturned the tables. Because they were robbing the father of the glory that he deserves. They were robbing worshipers of the opportunity to enter into worship. Judas Iscariot, you know Judas, the betrayer? He was the worst of Mary's critics. And John tells us that the only reason he was really interested is because he wanted the money himself, for himself. <laughs> Judas was a thief. He was a betrayer. He was a critic. And I'm going to say like, like, uh, likewise those who make worship about themselves. Let me be, let me be a little bit more blunt. I believe that if Jesus walked into many of our churches today, he would do the same thing. He would drive musicians and singers off the platform because he would tell them, you are just showcasing your talent, but you're not worshiping me. He would break the stage lights and the smoke machines and all the stuff. He says, you're trying to entertain the people, but you're not worshiping me. And he would make a cord of whips and he would put it on the back of many pastors who allow such folly in the church and encourage it. The next time that you're tempted to complain about the music being too loud or the worship being too long or not liking the songs or not singing the old songs, think about what good old John Calvin said. I think he says it pretty good. Music must not turn the church into an audience enjoying the music, but into a congregation singing the Lord's praises in his presence. It is not for you, it's for him. It's not about you, it's about him. We can, listen, nothing personal, but, but worship can happen here without you. It can happen without me. But we can't worship without his presence. We can't worship without his presence. If we're singing, playing, shouting, clapping, and listening to music without his presence, we're at a concert, but we're not worshiping. And but when we worship, worship brings the presence of God. Worship brings the presence of God. God is drawn to those who will worship him in spirit and in truth. The Father seeks those who will worship him in spirit and in truth. Worship gives glory to Christ. Yes, worship, whose goal is to please people and keep them coming, or is focused on keeping people happy is idolatry. It's idolatry. It's robbing God from what's that of, of that which belongs completely to Him. You know, true worship is costly. The perfume that Mary poured out on Jesus was appraised at fifty grand. I know my mind is like thinking, what can we do with 50 grand? <laughs> That's, I mean, we go there. We go there. But see, that, that money, it represented her life. You gotta understand this. That perfume was likely set aside as a dowry when she would marry. If she didn't marry, it was her retirement plan. It was her 401k. And when she, when she smashed the seal and broke it and poured it out on Jesus, she was giving him her everything. Her love, her hope, her security, her future. 
In essence, when she poured out that, that perfume on Jesus, it was like she, she was making Jesus her husband and putting her entire future in his hands. In doing so, she really did give Jesus everything. You know, I'm, I'm going to assume that Lazarus was significantly older than Mary. He was her caretaker. He was the one who watched over her. If she married, it would have been at his blessing. If she didn't marry, at his death, she would be on her own. And that perfume would have been her security and represent her future. But now it's, now it's, it's, it's on Jesus. It's, it's, it's drenching his hair and his clothing. And it's rolling off his feet onto the ground. It's lost. She threw it all on Jesus. I think that makes us uncomfortable too. Because that kind of worship is personal. It's intimate. It requires submission. Humility. Brokenness. Deep trust. Jesus, my hope isn't in this 50 grand. My hope is in you. I don't need this money, Jesus, but I need you. I don't want this money, Jesus, but I want you. Most of us only go so far. We'll, we'll, we'll go to a limit. But Mary gave Jesus everything. Mary didn't hold anything back. You know, in worship we sing. We sing songs like, I give you my heart, I give you my soul. I live for you alone. <coughs> or how about this one? I surrender most, sometimes a little. Or how about the one we sang last week? I am available. Are you? How about this one? He's all I need. He's all I need as long as I've got money in the bank and food in the cupboard and roof on my head and clothes on my... He's all I need as long as life is going okay. See, there's a world of difference between singing and breaking the seal and pouring out everything on Jesus. And when we see people like Mary giving everything to God, oh, that, that's fanatic. That, that, that's radicals. But Jesus calls them disciples. We justify our lack of commitment. Say, oh, well, that's just their calling. But Jesus doesn't really expect that from me. We might even admire such people. And say, but we don't really believe that it's necessary for, for us. The lukewarm, the carnal, the worldly. And those who have lost their first love, they don't understand Mary at all. And the only thing they can do is criticize her love, her extravagant worship <coughs> of the Savior. What was it that caused Mary to go to such lengths, to give so much, to express her devotion so, so beyond well, again, I point out to you that chapter 11 comes before chapter 12. And chapter 11 is the passage where Jesus raised Lazarus. Remember? When Lazarus got sick, Mary sent for Jesus. Jesus didn't come. When Jesus did come, Lazarus was already dead. Why didn't he come? Jesus could have saved my brother. When Jesus finally did come, only Mark, Martha went out to meet him. 
Mary didn't I want nothing to do with them. Jesus finally called for her, and then she, then she came. And when she saw him, what did she do? Lord, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. It's your fault. Oh. Read it. John chapter 11. But when Jesus saw her grief, the Bible says he was troubled in her, his spirit. The shortest verse in the Bible, and he wept. Then he did the unthinkable. He ordered that the stone be rolled away, even though that body was dead and decaying four days. In fact, if you like the King James, if you're reading King James, it says his body stinketh. Not a good smell. Then he issued the command. Lazarus, come forth. And death released him, and the breath of life was restored in him, and the dead man obeyed Jesus and walked out that tomb alive. Mary was beyond grateful. How do you express that? What do you do with that? But she also felt guilty because she doubted Jesus. She shook her fist at Jesus, yet he was gracious and he gave her brother back. I can just imagine that in the days to follow, Mary had to have pondered and prayed over that situation. And her heart, in her heart, she, it only grew to love Jesus more and more. And she felt that there must be something, there must be some way that she could let Jesus know just how much she appreciated and loved him. Yeah. Amen. And when Jesus showed up, you see, Worshippers are debtors of grace. Worshippers are debtors of grace. Mary worshipped extravagantly. What else could she do? Could she ever repay him? How could she? How, well, I mean, how could she ever? She, why? How could she not give him her all? There was another woman in the Bible. Sometimes I think we confuse the two stories. I think they were two different stories. Who also washed Jesus' feet with her tears and dried his feet with her hair. I, I really don't even think Mary knew this woman. Mary was a good girl. The Bible says this woman was a prostitute, a sinful woman. This woman, too, poured out perfume on Jesus and wept over him because of her many sins and dried his feet with her hair. The per her perfume was the uh, was the the uh, the uh, the salary of her occupation. Mary's perfume was the dowry she probably inherited from her father. It all took place in the home of a of a teacher of the law, a Pharisee. The Bible gives us his name. His name was Simon. And when Simon saw this this woman who once had lived a sinful life, weeping over Jesus and dr touching him and drying his, his feet with her hair. He began to criticize. He said, if this man were a prophet, he would know who this is and what kind of woman is touching him, for she is a sinner. And, but Jesus took up her cause, just like he did for Mary. And he told Simon a story that ends with a question. He says, Simon, I got something to say to you. And Simon says, bring it on. He said, two debtors were, two debtors to a certain, uh, two men were debtors to a certain money lender. One of, it, one of, one owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. When they were unable to pay, repay him, he forgave both of them. The man who owed a year and a half salary and the man who owed two months salary, they, they were equally forgiven. And then Jesus asked him a question. Which one then 
will love him more. The one who's forgiven 500 denarii, the one given 50, forgiven 50 denarii. And Simon, the Pharisee, I suppose the one who was forgiven more. And Jesus said, you judge correctly. But then he rebuked the Pharisee for his lack of love and said this. Therefore, I tell you, because her sins, because her many sins have been forgiven, she loved much. But he who has been forgiven little, loves little. Whether this woman who had led a sinful life for Mary, who experienced Jesus' compassion and received her brother back alive, both were debtors to Christ. Both were debtors to his grace. Both recognized their, their need and the dependence of God and how much Jesus had done for them. Friends, you and I, if we, if we get the right perspective, we are debtors of his grace. How can we then not follow their example and worship him with, with reckless abandon and disregard for man's opinion? We have been forgiven much. And the Lord, many of us, all of us, God has performed miracles and he has taken care of us. He has met us in a time of our deepest need. Bible says, to whom much is given, much more is required, right? Amen. We've been forgiven much. We have been given much. How then can we give back to him so little of our worship? John 12, 7, Jesus says, leave her alone. To me, this is the coolest part. And, and let, me, let me just say, I, I just submit this to you. If you think I've gone too far with this one, I'll let you off the hook. But it blesses me. Jesus said, leave her alone. She has kept this perfume in preparation for the day of my burial. You see, Jesus knew the cross was coming. Preparation for my burial. His death, it awaited. It was just one week out. Is it possible? I, I think it is. This is, where, this is where I'm at with this. That Mary had some sort of spiritual insight into this too. Did she know that this was going to be the last time that she would behold him? Did she know in her spirit the agony and the death that was coming? Is that why she chose to anoint him and give, give everything? I think it was. I really do. You know, perfume, it fades over time, right? When it, when it dries and evaporates on your, on your skin, slowly and surely it fades until you don't notice it anymore. But if you start sweating or you get hot, what happens? The smell, it, it reactivates, it comes alive again. You can, you, can get, you can get that fragrance again. Now when Jesus said, she kept this perfume in preparation for, my, for the day of my burial, I can't help but wonder, you know, in the garden when Jesus was sweating those drops of blood, I wonder when that sweat was on his forehead and he's running down. The smell was reactivated again. The smell of the perfume. I can't help but wonder <coughs> that when they stretched Jesus out and they took the, and they took those, those and he took that scourging and they began to tear the flesh off his body that was once drenched with this perfume, did the, the, the moisture of that blood, did it reactivate a little bit of that smell? When they put that old rugged cross on Jesus and he began to carry that up that hill, he, his, 
body began to, to sweat under its weight, under the strength, did that, did that sweat begin to reactivate some of the smell of that perfume that was just poured over him? When they stretched Jesus out on that cross and they drove the nails into his hands and his feet, again, did that blood mingle? Did, did he catch a whiff of that scent? I kind of think he did. And with every step of that next week, Everything that he did, the fragrance of her love, did it somehow, did it somehow encourage him and remind him as to what he was doing and why he was doing it? When we worship, when we worship, when we really worship, worship team, When we worship God like Mary, does Jesus think, man, it, it was worth it? It was worth it. When the Father hears our praise and he, and he feels our love, does he think, man, they were worth it? They were worth it all. <clears throat> I know we already worshiped, but stand with me. Can I just say to you, stop being a critic of worshipers and become one. <laughs> when we criticize worship or how others worship, I'm going to tell you something. It says more about us than it does them. James tells us that praise and thanksgiving cannot flow from out of the same heart, out of the same mouth. Out of the same mouth come praise, uh, come blessing and cursing. My brothers, this should not be. So if you find yourself criticizing others and, and their, their acts of worship, man, just repent. <laughs> and ask God to give you a new heart and renew your spirit. Friend, I'm telling you, it says something more about, about you than it does them. Can we stop robbing God of what is His, His glory? You see, when you withhold your song, when you withhold your praise, when you hold back your worship, your love, your devotion, you're robbing God of what is His. It, you're robbing Him of His glory. When we make worship about us, about the songs we like, the feelings, the goosebumps, the tingles, become a thief just like Judas. When you put limits on how far you go, or when you're available, you're, again, you're robbing God. Can you determine, with, can we determine today that as a church, can we decide today that we will worship God, that we will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, that we will give God everything and pour out our being for Him. What others call wasteful, what others criticize, God seeks and blesses. Why don't you guys just come?
Now let's just let's just begin to worship him. Come on. Thank you, Jesus. Joel, may we get the words back up. I forgot about that. Will you please get me started and I'll try to read them? Even though I'm hoarse. Amanda! Oh, here we go! The troops are arriving. Help us. <laughs> come on. Let's come on, let's just worship him this morning. Let's let's just open our hearts to him. Let's give him everything.
Right close 